Welcome to another one of my short videos. This one, uh, I'm going to face the big issue of carbon. Carbon is uh, integral in forestry, in tree growing. So these trees are made up of carbon and we'll explore how much carbon there is. The opportunities have been talked about for farmers to be rewarded for their carbon. In fact, rewarded for changing land use from what used to be pasture into forest and then making a commitment to that for 25, 50, 100 years or more. And that raises one of the big issues. And I want to explore some of the issues in today's video that looks at this. But first of all, let's explore how much carbon there actually is in a standing tree like these. We grow these trees for uh, many different reasons. Primarily because we needed trees in this landscape. So for conservation, shade and shelter, uh, biodiversity, which you can hear in the background. But uh, all the way along, um, I've always been exploring how we can turn those trees that we plant for conservation and agriculture into, into profit. So I'm as interested in anyone in getting a commercial return for these trees. And uh, the one way to do it is to grow timber. All trees grow wood, and as you know, wood contains carbon. So we harvested this tree, uh, made some furniture out of it. Out of it. Um, this is an example of some of our timber. Uh, this is a 10 centimetre cube of 25-year-old uh, uh, eucalyptus globulus, blue gum. Now, I can weigh that and I can test the moisture content and I can calculate how much carbon there is in it. A 10 centimetre cube has 1,000 cubic centimetres of volume. Uh, even a regular shape, I could lower this into water and work out the volume of it. But in this case, it's a nice simple calculation. I can weigh this, it's 850 grams. So, given that, I can work out its density. But before I work out that, I should really test the moisture content. And I've looked at the moisture content of this. It was dried in the kiln, tested with our moisture meter. It's 12%, or furniture grade, if you like. So it's very stable inside. Uh, it's, it's quite nice timber, it worked quite well. So I've got here a block of wood that weighs 850 grams, how much carbon is actually stored in that? If I take all the moisture out of this, it will lower the weight of this down to bone dry wood with no moisture at all at 760 grams. That's accounting for the 12% that's currently in this block as moisture. Okay, so I've got 760 grams of cellulose and lignin and the other components that make up the wood. We know from a lot of research that about half of that, or in fact, almost exactly, between 49 and 51% of this is carbon. So I actually know now the weight of carbon stored in this, which is half of 760, which is 380 grams. Now that carbon must have come out of the atmosphere. It can't come from any other source. Through the process of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide is drawn in, combined with water, uh, and then turned into sugars and then carbohydrates and various other carbon polymers and products which actually make up the wood itself. So we've got in here 380 grams of carbon element that came from carbon dioxide. And we can actually work out what the carbon dioxide equivalent is. And you do that by using the molecular weight of carbon and comparing it to the molecular weight of carbon dioxide. Now carbon has a molecular weight of 12. Carbon dioxide includes the 12 but also two oxygen atoms which are 16 each making a total of 44. So what we do to actually work out the carbon dioxide equivalent is to multiply the 380 by 44 divided by 12 and that gives us 1.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide to make up what was actually less than a kilogram of wood. So every kilogram of wood is taking out more than a kilogram of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. To help us visualize that, think of how much volume is required in terms of carbon dioxide as a gas to create this much wood. And that's what this ball represents. That's 0.8 of a cubic meter of carbon dioxide that's required to produce the wood that's here. So we've effectively locked up 
that much carbon dioxide in wood. So there's no doubt about it. If you grow wood, particularly if you harvest and store it for a long period of time, you are drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and storing it for a long period. That's all good. So you'd think if uh, farmers like myself and hundreds of other small timber growers and people revegetating farms, that they should be rewarded for that. We hear a lot about paying farmers to take carbon out of the atmosphere. Now we're doing it. I don't think many growers will be surprised, but maybe the wider community is surprised to find out that almost zero farmers who plant trees integrated with their agricultural enterprises at a scale that would suit a family forestry or family farming operation are able to benefit in Australia from that carbon. Because the rules and the conditions are so restrictive that uh, it would cost too much. Now there are many examples of why, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, first point is that I can't be rewarded for any of the carbon that you can see in these trees, because the trees were planted before 1990. I knew about uh, greenhouse issues back in 1990, and planting trees was obviously going to have an impact, but then over time the rules change. In fact, if you're interested in planting trees, you can't actually get rewarded in Australia for trees planted before about 2010. And uh, so you, you've immediately got a whole bunch of landholders who are doing the right thing between 1990 and 2010, who are growing trees on their land, who have been disenfranchised immediately by the fact that their trees were planted too early to benefit. Um, I get told sour grapes. Yeah, that's your problem. Okay, well let's look at this example. If you plant trees under the schemes, you can only plant and be rewarded if the site wasn't used for tree growing or had no trees on it, very few trees on it, prior to whatever the date it might be, for at least five years in most conditions. The perverse outcomes of that is when I cut these trees down for timber, if I start replanting, such as this, I can't be rewarded for the carbon that's locked up in the future. So the perverse outcome is that the best option for me, if I wanted to get into the carbon market, was to take this tree, these trees away and convert it to pasture and plant up a site on the farm that had no trees on it. Irrespective of the fact that this is a site which needs trees for conservation, as we're right next to the creek. What are the other problems? There's this additionality rule. It was funny, just to use my example, uh, I was told because I was planting trees on my farm and because I spoke about growing trees for conservation and profit prior to 1990, tree growing was part of my practice. Therefore, even if I do plant trees on a site that had no trees on it, I can't be rewarded because I was a tree grower. I didn't change my behavior because of the rules. The major issue that affects small growers, even if they try to deal with all the rules about planting trees to fit into the carbon market options that currently exist in Australia, is that the cost of auditing is too high. I've been told by some of the auditors that you may need a minimum of 100 hectares of forest, a very uniform forest, not all this integrated, multi-purpose, mixed species, uh, managed in different methods and different sites. That's too complicated. The rules basically end up only supporting people who are prepared to do fairly uniform plantings over a large area starting in a single year. And there is the permanence requirement. Now they keep changing the rules and reducing it. They have farm forestry uh, options at the moment which have a minimum of 25 years. The permanent plantings generally go out to 100 years or so. So what they're actually paying for is a change of land use. They're not rewarding you for the carbon that you actually grow and you store in timber and lock up in houses. They're actually paying you to change practice from pasture to forest and to maintain that under forest for a minimum of 25 years. So if these trees, for example, die as a result of climate change, 
and I'd taken a carbon package initially, I would at my own cost have to replant that in a similar forest. So you can see there that the permanence requirements take away management flexibility from landholders. And over and above the auditing costs, why would I? Why would I commit next generation, but also subsequent owners of this property to take on a liability to maintain those trees and manage them the way that I thought was appropriate when I started? Flexibility is crucial in family forestry. It underpins your capital. And I suspect that's probably the main issue that farmers aren't planting trees. So is there any way that um, the programs could be developed that actually support farmers, uh, family forest owners, small farmers who are planting trees for these multiple benefits that don't by their very nature put conditions on what they plant, how they manage it, how long they look after it. Because if we're going to encourage hundreds of thousands of farmers to plant trees on their property, we need to do it in a way that encourages innovation, builds in flexibility, allows people to change their mind. So there are options. I understand that uh, through satellite data, the federal government is using these trees to actually achieve their Kyoto agreements. The government's getting the benefit of our trees, not only for carbon, water quality, biodiversity, supporting industry, whatever our trees actually do. So is there a way, a very simple way, that we as small growers can benefit and be rewarded? A, a simple thank you might be enough. But more seriously, clearly there's an opportunity, if they're collecting data through satellites, to simply send me a check maybe once every five years, that represents a very conservative estimate of the value of the carbon that I've been holding for that five year period. It wouldn't lock me into any future requirement to sustain that carbon. I call it the hot potato approach. When you play a game of hot potato, it's how long you can hold it and then you throw it to somebody else. Carbon is locked up if someone is holding the carbon. They don't have to, as an individual, hold that for 25 or 100 years. They just have to hold it for a period of time. And then they might harvest one planting, and then the carbon they're being stored somewhere else and being held for a period of time. Now, using simple discounted economics, you might say that the value of that carbon being held is the long-term value of a carbon unit divided by some amount. Let's say divide it by 20 times, 5% of the carbon price, for example, would be the benefit of a landholder holding carbon. If I just got, and the other farmers who do this, got a simple check for 5% of the carbon, the estimated conservatively that was being held on our farm on an annual basis, it wouldn't require any detailed auditing. It wouldn't require detailed mapping. It certainly wouldn't require commitment on the title to the future management. It wouldn't require any paperwork at all. We don't know where and in what way trees will support farming families across this country. We have many ideas and many of us are playing with different options and species. But we cannot constrain the future by our limited knowledge of what's happening now. And in the context of climate change, where the future is uncertain, the worst thing we can do is constrain future decision making, future land management options by our limited understanding of what the future might actually look like, which trees will perform, which markets will work. Ultimately, for all to benefit, we need more trees in the landscape. These trees lock up carbon, no question. There's the result. But are we going to reward small farmers, family forest owners, innovative landholders who are going to explore these practices? Currently, the system is not. And we need to explore ways that we can. Thank you very much. To the hot potato. <laughs>